this is Eric Sinrod in the San Francisco office of Dwayne Morris. Um, we're bringing you uh, your regular uh, Tech Law 10, where the law and information technology intersect. I'm joined, of course, as always, by my colleague, Jonathan Armstrong. Uh, Jonathan, I believe you're considering the Internet of Things. And also the Beatles had a lyric, baby, you can drive my car. Where are you going to go? Where are you going to take us? Yeah, well, well, thanks very much for that, Eric. And um, yeah, a, a slightly different circumstances. I'm no longer with Cordry. I'm with uh, uh, Elevate, and I'm just spelling it so that you can look us up, L minus sign EV8. And we've been looking at the skills knowledge gap of directors. And I, I should add that I'm joining a law firm shortly, but uh, Elevate is one of my passions. And we've talked before, haven't we, about the skills gap on boards when it comes to AI and a lot of boards not having a tech competent director and how that causes uh, compliance and governance issues. And I think we get the same issues with things like Internet of Things and uh, connected vehicles, et cetera, et cetera. And I think a lot of organizations perhaps haven't thought through those risks as well as they should have done. And I've done a couple of sessions recently with boards and with senior leadership teams looking at some of the issues that might be involved in Internet of Things and in uh, connected vehicles more specifically. So um, I guess if we're going through Beatles lyrics, uh, I... Uh, haven't looked at this uh, from a Scandinavian point of view as a Norwegian would, but I've tried to have, a... <laughs> but I've tried to have a broad look at some of the issues that would apply in Europe and, and possibly in the US as well. So I guess the first thing to say is that whenever you're involved in autonomous vehicles and connected cars, there's an awful lot of personal data flowing around the system. And of course, different vehicles are doing different things. So if I'm in uh, uh, Colorado, for example, I might be taking an automated taxi back to the airport. And that's measuring all sorts of things because the driver has to be there on standby in that scenario. So it's looking at things like alertness of the driver, number of passengers, there are um, uh, weighing devices in seats, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, even you know, regular vehicles will have that sort of functionality. So if you have a car where it tells you that there are passengers in the back seat who haven't fastened their safety belt, oftentimes that's these weighing devices feeding back into the ECU, the brain of the vehicle, and, 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 and gathering all sorts of data. And even non-autonomous vehicles are hugely complicated beasts now with hundreds of thousands of lines of code and uh, e e ECUs, so effectively almost supercomputers trying to manage the, uh, the, the various operations uh, around the vehicle. And even sort of the most basic vehicles have a lot of tech involved. So first of all, as, as I've said, there's lots of personal data around the system. Uh, cars are assessing the performance of drivers. And you can see that if you have, I've got a BMW, for example, you can get a driving analysis that the, uh, the, that the vehicle is using to work out, you know, your driving style and uh, and, and also to work out your level of alertness so that it knows when it might have to step in through operating the automated uh, uh, braking system, et cetera. And for employers, of course, there are concerns about the use of that personal data because it might uh, potentially be uh, indicative of things that the employee might not want the employer to know. Now, obviously, most employers would want to know about alcohol impairment when driving, and that's fairly justifiable. 
But things like geolocation are always going to be a concern to privacy regulators, for example. We've had the Foodino and Deliveroo cases that involve geo-tracking of delivery riders and delivery drivers, where the uh, Garanta, the Italian Data Protection Authority, has said that constant geolocation is unlikely to be justifiable. And of course, geolocation could lead to all sorts of other elements of sensitive personal data. So if I park outside the same uh, synagogue on a Friday, then my employer may assume from that that I'm Jewish, and, and that in itself would count as sensitive personal data under GDPR. And location data is always likely to be problematical because you can unintentionally acquire sensitive personal data, you know, if people visit a clinician regularly, if they visit a hospital, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And additionally, whenever you get into even regular cars as well as connected vehicles, things like consent, which is often used to justify the processing of personal data, are always challenging. So, uh, so we've had, I think, an early case in the US around geolocation of uh, uh, hired vehicles and the hire company levying fines when people went too fast or went out of state or whatever. And that's always problematical because even if you've got consent from the person who hired the vehicle, they might not be the driver at that particular time. And in a, a company vehicle scenario, then it might be hard to track uh, who's driving the vehicle at one particular time. If it's a pool vehicle, for example, and the records aren't that good as to uh, who's got the vehicle when. And uh, as I've said, that's uh, always problematical when we've got this heightened level of telemetry going on and connected cars obviously accentuate uh, that uh, uh, as well, simply because they're gathering more data and, and, and feeding it back. And as, as we've said on podcasts before, it also makes a challenge with transparency as well, because even some automotive manufacturers don't have full visibility into everything that the vehicle is doing. We live in a world where a lot of uh, automotive manufacturers have effectively subcontracted elements of the vehicle out to other companies. So they might use a, a TCU, a transmission control unit, from a transmission specialist like a ZF. They might have an ECU, this computer brain of the car, from a provider like Bosch. So some of the car manufacturers may not have full visibility on all of the tech in the vehicle. And that means transparency is more challenging for a hire company or for a dealership when selling a vehicle because they might not know exactly what's going on. So you can't fulfill your transparency obligations under GDPR, for example, unless you know exactly what's going on uh, under the hood. And in addition, we've got a whole host of other regulations around the world, some of which are specific to uh, uh, automated vehicles, but some of which also involve things like data security. So the NIST 2 directive will extend um, the obligations to report uh, data, uh, report bre breaches, whether or not they involve data, to some uh, automotive type operations. And we've got product liability measures as well. The UK, for example, recently brought in new legislation on things like default passwords for internet connected devices. You know, you can't just set them as one, 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 one. You've got to think more studiously about data security. So it seemed to me that this is just another one of those issues where organizations need to have uh, knowledge and need to work out what exactly is happening. This isn't just organizations that have their own fleet of vehicles or manufacture vehicles. It's organizations that rent vehicles for employees through Hertz or a car hire company that allow employees to do so on their corporate credit cards when traveling. 
because as uh, vehicles, whether connected or not, get uh, ever more complex, then so some of the risks that we have to think through increase. And this is worrying not only, of course, because employees are concerned if they feel they're being spied upon. It, it's it's worrying because this is getting the attention of a number of regulators, some of which are, who are introducing specific codes. But it's also worrying from an investigatory point of view as well. If you suspect your employees have done something wrong, your um, inclination for most organizations is to get you know, the truck driver's records and work out where he was and when. Um, but even that can be problematical if you haven't set up the ability to gather that data in the right way. So slightly off the wall topic, but I thought it was uh, worth discussing. Well, like the Beatles, you haven't missed a beat since you've been, <laughs> you, you were away on holiday and you're back and you're still going strong. And I'm surprised when you mentioned vehicles being beasts, you didn't invoke the Rolling Stones and refer to them as beasts of burden, but there we are. Um, but more seriously, Jonathan, I do have a question for you. Um, you know, we've talked about AI. Uh, you're now blending into you know the Internet of Things, uh, relating specifically to vehicles. Um, you mentioned, and there's been discussion about you know the skills knowledge gap uh, having to do with boards. My question for you is to help fill that knowledge gap, if you will, do you envision boards being able to consolidate uh, that knowledge, if you will, within one person who has expertise across all these areas? Are they gonna need to have multiple people handling different aspects of these complicated issues? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I think the answer is, Perhaps it depends. I know that's a, a lawyer's answer that we try and avoid. I think for some boards, um, if they are dealing with complex uh, tech issues, then they won't be able to find one person who can uh, who, who can understand everything. So you might find that um, the, the, the tech-dependent organizations need people to cover different seats. But for a smaller business, that's got technology as a sort of, um, I mean, nobody's got technology as an incidental area of their business, but something that's less critical. They might be able to get, you know, a good all round technologist who understands a bit of AI, a bit of cybersecurity um, and, and, and a bit of um, uh, crisis management and crisis planning. But, the reality is that even the largest corporations, you know, there's an EY study, which I think says something like uh, last year, 58% of US listed entities uh, had a gap for somebody right. with, with technology knowledge on the board. But even the largest corporations aren't doing this well. And, and, and I guess my answer would be one person with a technology understanding is at least a start. It's That's better true. than none. And, right. and it might be for those tech dependent businesses, they need two or three people. And, and, and I guess the other thing to say is that, you know, boards need to be, be more diverse and they need to be more diverse, uh, not only in terms of, uh, you know, background and gender, uh, uh, and that is important as well, but also in terms of knowledge, we tend to have, uh, a perception that boards are often, you know, pale, white, stale, male, and that has to change. We have to, uh, uh, and in some cases, that will mean younger board members, which is obviously one of the reasons for uh, Elevate, really, to try and 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 look at the next generation of board members and and obviously it's 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 usually easier to pick somebody with the relevant technical yeah. skills and train them in how to be a director than it is to take an existing 75 year old experienced corporate director and telling them how to be an ai specialist an internet of things specialist a tech specialist 
Pale, Stale, White Male. It sounds like the title of a new song. One more question, if I may. So yeah. with respect to that 58% figure, which accords to what I remember uh, reading myself, um, do you believe those companies, uh, while they don't have the knowledge gap fulfilled within the board itself, are getting that expertise from the outside? I'm not convinced they are in many cases. And even if they are, you still need to have that check and balance on the board. You know, if we said, um, well, we don't really need anybody on the board with financial expertise or audit expertise, because we've got external auditors and they look after these things. Frankly, you'd have your bumps felt. People would think you're just crazy. And we we've accepted the fact that every board has to have at least one director who's financially competent, financially literate, often from an audit background in a big four accountancy firm yeah. and and cyber risk technology risk ai risk and ai opportunity opportunity as well as risk is as big an issue for corporations and we can't have boards purely relying on hiring in uh, a hired gun they need to have somebody on the board every day looking at these type of issues. Agreed. Okay. Well, I think we're at least at our 10, if not beyond. So I'll close it down on my end. This is Eric Sinrod uh, in San Francisco, the San Francisco office of Dwayne Morris, although my virtual background's my law school when I went to University of Michigan. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you, Jonathan. Of course, my email is ejsinrod at duanemorris.com. I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Eric, and and, and really good to get back. Um, I'm, <laughs> so yeah. I'm still Jonathan Armstrong, but with a new email address, jonathan at l-ev8.com. Hopefully those email addresses are appearing on the bottom of the screen now. And um, yeah, as I say, great to be doing these again. And we thanks everyone for watching or listening. And we'll be back again, I guess, in a month or so.